Welcome to my Scrum Crash Course. Hi, I'm Coach Takeshi. If we're going to do Scrum, let's do Scrum properly. No Scrummy or pick and choose Scrum, okay? So we'll learn Scrum in its entirety. And this crash course will cover what we need to know about Scrum from beginning to end with no corners cut short. Okay, so before you start, you've been already given prep instructions separately. So just a quick recap. First, if you, have, if you haven't watched the Agile 101 video yet, please do so. Please do not proceed to learn Scrum before first learning and thinking why we do Agile. A meta thinking process of, for example, why, why we do things in iterations in Agile. And in Agile, why we no longer seek instructions from bosses and managers, but decide on our own what to do and how to do things. Without these thinkings, we might end up just learning Scrum as going through the motions mechanistically. The worst type of Scrum is project managed Scrum. Scrum is for product development. Let's make sure we understand the difference before we start. And have you already read the Scrum Guide? Although we will cover the Scrum Guide thoroughly in this crash course, this course is not a substitute of the guide. So please do read. It's only 14 pages. Also, Gunther Verheyen's Scrum Pocket Guide is very useful in getting a grasp of the whole flow of Scrum. So at least please read chapter two of that book. And finally, after today's crash course, the real learning of Scrum happens at the Genba, which is a lean term that means the place of action. So do practice Scrum. If you are an aspiring Agile coach, please do not coach Scrum without first immersing yourself in the practice. Opportunities abound. Perhaps just call up a VC friend and ask to be introduced to a starter company in their portfolio and offer yourself as a free or cheap Scrum master. Okay, so ready? Let's jump into Scrum. The 2020 Scrum Guide defines Scrum as the following. Scrum is a lightweight framework that helps people, teams, and organizations generate value through adaptive solutions for complex problems. There are a few highlights here. The first one is Scrum is a lightweight framework. The second part is about value generation. And the third part is that Scrum is a solution development framework for complex adaptive problems. Scrum is simple. The Scrum framework is purposely incomplete. Various processes, techniques, and methods can be employed with the framework. Okay? This is the part where the lightweight framework comes in. Scrum is not a methodology. So even if you follow Scrum step by step, you won't get results. Scrum is simply a framework for doing things. Yes? And it's very complementary with other processes, techniques, methods, approaches, whatever you want to call them. So for example, I use design thinking in combination with Scrum a lot. Rather than provide people with detailed instructions, the rules of Scrum guide their relationships and interactions. Yes. So the rules of Scrum, simply it's more of a guide. It's not an instruction. Scrum theory. Scrum is founded on empiricism and lean thinking. This is very interesting because in the 2020 Scrum Guide, the mentioning of lean has become explicit. Yes. In the 2017 guide, it was not. It was common sense because Scrum is, is a practice of both Agile and actually, you know, Agile naturally encompasses lean. So it's a, it's, it's a lot of common sense that has been built into the official Scrum language now. So empiricism, okay? Empiricism asserts that knowledge comes from experience and making decisions based on what is observed, okay? It's all about facts. It's evidence-based management. This is the basis of Scrum. Lean thinking reduces waste and focuses on the essentials. So this is a lean con concept of reduction of waste, muda, yes. Alrighty, Scrum in a nutshell. 
this nutshell description of Scrum is something new in the 2020 Scrum Guide. In a nutshell, Scrum requires a Scrum Master to foster an environment where a product owner orders the work for a complex problem into a product backlog. The Scrum team turns a selection of the work into an increment of value during a sprint. The Scrum team and its stakeholders inspect the results and adjust for the next sprint. And then you repeat. Yes. So already in this space, in this nutshell part, you can see Scrum is led by the product owner and the Scrum team to servant leaders. It's about creating the environment and, uh, and uh, you know, helping people uh, realize value uh, within the Scrum framework. Yes. And then the last point, the fourth point, the repeat part, this is very important because in Agile, iteration. This is really, really the basis of the activity. Alrighty, the Scrum framework. So we will, you know, this Scrum can become overwhelming. Although it's a lightweight framework, it is role based. So there's quite a lot of things, you know, um, that that we can get lost. So the taxonomy. Yes, remember these these key headline items: the pillars, the values, the Scrum team events, and artifacts. And along with artifacts, we have the commitments for the artifacts. Again, this is something new in the Scrum uh, Scrum Guide 2020. Okay. There are three pillars, Scrum pillars, transparency, inspection, and adaptation. And there are five values, focus, openness, courage, commitment, and respect. There are three accountabilities in the Scrum team, the developers, the product owner, and the scrum master. And then there are five events in, in scrum. The sprint itself, sprint planning, daily scrum, sprint review, and sprint retrospective. There are three artifacts, the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and increment. Yes, an increment is an artifact. We'll get to that. And each of these artifacts Scrum Guide 2020 has made it explicit what the commitments are. So the commitment of a product backlog is the product goal. The commitment of the sprint backlog is a sprint goal. And the commitment of the increment is definition of done. Now, I actually would like to add rules back into the Scrum framework. Although in the 2017 guide, it was a little bit more explicit and less on the 2020 guide. I find that, you know, Scrum, since it's it's like a game, you know, and every game has a rule. It's good to have the, the rule mindset um, because it's, it's very easy to organize the thoughts. So I'm just going to put it here. Okay. So we're going to take a look at each of these uh, um, uh, elements. So we'll first look into the pillars. Okay. And uh, let's go. All right. The Scrum pillars, the three pillars, actually it's the three pillars of, pillars of empiricism, okay? So transparency, inspection, adapt, adaptation, all right? These are the three Scrum pillars of empiricism, okay? Empiricism means working in a fact-based, experience-based and evidence-based manner. Progress is based on observations of reality not fictitious plans, right? So not about predictions. It's about, you know, uh, it's about uh, measured evidence, things that you can, you know, measure the value. Right? Transparency. Transparency means making the emergent process and work visible. We all know what's going on. Inspect scrum artifacts and progress towards goals frequently and diligently. Inspection enables adaptation. In inspection without adaptation is considered pointless. Scrum events are designed to provoke change. So check your work as you do it. And then last one, adaptation. Adaptation in this context is about continuous improvement, the ability to adapt based on the results of the inspection. Adaptation becomes more difficult when the people involved are not empowered or self-managing. Note that the language has changed from self-organized to self-managed. This is a change in, in Scrum Guide 2020. Okay. 
A Scrum team is expected to adapt the moment it learns anything new through inspection. So adaptation. It's okay to change tactical, um, tactical direction once we have new information. Okay. All right, so next we're going to look into the Scrum values. The first Scrum value is focus. Without the Scrum values and the focus, we would be just going through the motions of Scrum. We focus on having a done increment, at least by the end of every sprint, yes? So it's important to close every sprint. And the important thing here is to deliver a done increment. The Scrum events and artifacts help create focus on inspecting progress and new information. Yes. This new information part, you know, it sounds a little bit obvious, but we often, you know, overlook it. Um, you know, because, you know, we're so process driven and just following it, even if new information comes in, we actually don't really activate our curiosity and pick those things up. So in Scrum, during the sprint, if new information comes in, it's a very, very important thing that we pay atten attention to because we need to adapt to new information. We focus on the sprint goal to guide the team in what to deliver. The product backlog is an ordered list. Okay, a backlog is a list. Okay, and that creates focus on what is most important. Uh, what is the most important thing to do next? Yes. So, um, uh, um, backlog refinement, prioritization, very very important activity in Scrum. Time boxed events create a sense of urgency and help us focus on the purpose mm -hmm. of the event. So Scrum is a time box agile approach. There are other non time box, uh, um, you know, Scrum, uh, you know, approaches like uh, Scrum Bun and so on and so forth. Yes. And in this case, um, Scrum, because we have a fixed sprint cycle, it's a time box agile approach. The entire Scrum team is accountable for creating a valuable, useful increment every sprint. Scrum defines a, a, three specific accountabilities within the Scrum team, the developers, the product owner, and the Scrum master. So not roles, but accountabilities. So a bit of a unique way of using the language yes, in, in the Scrum guide. Focus facilitates empiricism and collaborative teamwork. Instead of people working independently on separate product backlog items, Scrum teams are often more effective when they collaborate on one or two things. Okay. Now, during the, 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 the sprint, yes, division of labor, um, each developer can work on you know, uh, things uh, you know, um, uh, separately. That's fine. It's, it's up to, you know, it's, it's the, the, the team's choice. But meanwhile, there is an encouragement, um, you know, to simplify things and work on one thing at a time together, collaboratively. That is an encouragement under the Scrum Guide. The entire Scrum team's shared accountability to deliver a valuable, useful increment creates a focus on the overall outcome, not simply on what each individual can accomplish. Yes, so we say there's no, a no blame culture inside um, an agile team, in the scrum team, no finger pointing, because it's not a responsibility of a single you know, scrum team member uh, to deliver something. It's a shared accountability. It's very, very important. Having a product goal creates focus on where we are going and that can inform the team's decision on a daily basis, yes daily see often cases if we take a project approach you know um we get called into project meetings but then we don't really work on it until you know we we we, we jump onto that project in the case of scrum it's daily yes so we work on a daily iteration we don't do context switching and this continue on this is a very very important part about scrum and that's the reason why we do this as a sprint as a stable team of uh, you know of, of developers, product owner, and Scrum master. When there are competing priorities, focus helps a team decide what is the most important thing right now. 
when the future is uncertain, there is a tendency to want to keep analyzing. Yes, analysis paralysis. Focus helps a team accept uncertainty. Look at what they know, know today and take a small step. Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. In my case, I add overwhelming. So VUCA O. We live in this kind of world. So that's the reason why we experiment and iterate with, with Scrum. Okay. And Scrum, you have the thinking time, the sprint review, the sprint retro, uh, um, uh, retro and then, then the sprint planning. But then during the sprint, you try to, uh, the, the, the development days, you really, really try to concentrate on working on all of these things. So when something that you don't know, um, we tend to get stuck. But Scrum really, really encourages, you know, uh, to, to pushing and going into execution during uh, the, the um, you know, in between sprint planning and sprint review. Yes. So we do the thinking and the doing, you know, clean switch. Yes. Meanwhile, if there is new information that comes in, we adapt. And that's the, that's how we keep on making things you know, going on in, in this Scrum. OK, second one, Scrum values, openness. Being open about our work helps create transparency to our progress. Without transparency, any attempt to inspect and adapt will be flawed. Openness facilitates collaborative teamwork. It enables team members to ask for help and offer help to each other. Yes, so this is a very important. In a traditional hierarchical organization, you have a clean leader follower fixed structure, yes? Now in the scrum team, everybody leads each other and everybody follows each other. So depending on whatever that you're working, if you are closest to the information, if you are, have the knowledge and skills, you lead and then other people follow. And you, and you as a leader, you offer help. And as follower, you ask for help. That's how it works. That's the reason why it's a self-managed team rather than a hierarchy. Openness enables team members to share their perspectives, feel heard by their peers, and be able to support team decisions. Yes, so behavioral aspects of um, the Scrum teamwork, very, very important. Openness facilitates empiricism. When our assumptions turn out to be invalid, openness helps us admit we were wrong and change direction. So persevere, pivot, or tweak as in Lean Startup, yes. Um, you know, we don't have to get stuck, um, you know, if we find a new information saying that what, um, you know, we are doing is wrong, our hypothesis is wrong. So in that case, you can switch to something else, pivot, or you tweak, okay? So there are built-in mechanisms around this. We will later, later on, you know, talk about uh, the sprint goal and how, and, you know, who can stop, uh, who can stop the sprint in the worst case, but most likely, how we maintain the sprint goal and tweak the way we do things so that we will, we will be able to create an incremental value still while maintaining the sprint goal. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Limiting a sprint to one month or less promotes an openness to changing direction based on new information. Yes. So in the waterfall project, you have 18 months, six months, whatever that waterfall, you know, um, uh, um, project term is. And during that you know, uh, period, you can't really change directions. But in, in Scrum, the sprints are short, maximum one month, typically two weeks, or you know, sometimes even shorter, one week. So we have the ability to keep on making course adjustments you know, continuously. The sprint goal is fixed and provides guidance, but the plan for meeting the sprint goal is open to change based on what developers are learning as they do the work. So yes, as I er earlier uh, you know, explained, the sprint goal is fixed. So what kind of sprint goal to set? Actually, that's, that's quite an art. And that's, that's one of the, 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 the practices uh, uh, you know, uh, that you have to really become uh, you know, uh, proficient in sprint planning. But yes, you put together an, um, a big enough um, and flexible enough sprint goal that you make adjustments on how to achieve that. But the sprint goal itself doesn't change. A transparent product backlog demonstrates openness with stakeholders about what value is planned for the product and what is not planned and what is likely to be next, okay? Transparent product backlog. 
So in a, um, in a physical office setting, the Kanban board often is, is in a place where it's quite visible and everybody is able to see that. And we actually do invite stakeholders to sometimes stop by to, to, to see, see you know, uh, where, where things are. You know, um, we don't need to, to receive the inspection or, you know, a check-ins from the stakeholders. They can come and go as they, as they wish, wish and take a look. It's all about transparency and openness. And even the product backlog is made like that. The sprint review demonstrates openness to sharing progress with our stakeholders, as well as openness to feedback and collaboration with them. Same. Uh, so this is a sprint review. It's the event, yes, that, that uh, we, 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 we use for, for really uh, creating transparency on where we are and what we are doing and how we are. The sprint retrospectives focus on continuous improvement. Our team's interactions, processes, and tools invite an openness to feedback, reflection. So this is a retrospection. This is why the word retrospection comes in and changing how we work. Yes. So this changing part, it will tie in next into the courage part. Courage. Every scrum event is an opportunity to inspect and adapt. With courage, we know it's okay to tweak or pivot. We can change direction regarding what we are building. We can change direction regarding how we are building it. The time box, the time box of sprint limits the impact of failure to the length of the sprint. This gives us courage to try new things, to experiment, to learn. Yes. So an 18 month waterfall, might cost you $1 million, $2 million. But if you break it up, break it up two weeks, it might just cost $10,000 compared to a one, $1 million loss, $10,000. You know, it's a very small percentage and that gives you courage to try do trial and error. The product owner is accountable for maximizing the value of the product. So she can demonstrate courage by saying no to low value features. The developers are accountable for instill, inst instilling quality by adhering to a definition of done. So they can demonstrate courage by saying no to cutting quality under pressure. Okay, the courage to say no. It takes courage to be transparent about progress under pressure to deliver faster. Yes, yes. deadlines. Yes, it's, it's something that we, we almost um, dogmatically feel that we have to you know, meet. But it does take courage to be transparent, you know, about pro progress. Mm. Don't develop the, the, the wrong thing just for the sake of meeting deadlines. That's courage. It takes courage to not show our stakeholders undone work. So a scrum rule is definition of done. You cannot call anything an increment unless it meets the definition of done. You cannot release an increment unless it's done. It takes courage to ask for help or admit we do not know how to do something. That's the reason why a Scrum team is cross-functional, so we can help each other, ask each other. And as a matter of fact, even outside of the Scrum team, use of subject matter experts. These are things that are very, very integral to, to uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the openness and uh, courage of, of the Scrum values. It takes courage to hold others accountable when they are not meeting commitments to the team. Yes, if you see somebody not doing something, sometimes we we withhold. We become, you know, in 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 the language of radical candor, we become ruinously empathetic. Okay, we need to speak up when we see that somebody is not upholding, uh, you know, their 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 accountability. It takes courage. We may discover we build something our customers don't want. It, take cur it takes courage to admit our assumptions were wrong and change the direction, pivot and tweaking. It takes courage to try to build something we've never built before, not knowing if it will work or not. Hmm. Yes, Scrum allows you to explore. Yes, it's very important for innovation. It takes courage to share a dissenting opinion with a team member and engage in productive conflict. 
this is a high order teamwork and as a as as a as a behavioral coach it's probably um a good chunk of of the the coaching work um you know um that i spent time with the teams yes differing opinions hear each other out suspend your assumptions you know really have a shared understanding even if you are um you know have to have differing and you know opinions and most importantly the ability to come to a, an agreement i still believe this but as a team we decided to go for this hypothesis therefore i support yes so it's very very important that to, you know to um and to for everybody to have the courage to be able to accept doing something that even if you don't completely agree to but as a team you support commitment commitment to scrum is not a promise to deliver a set of scope by a set date nope nope that's not the target you know meeting the deadline um that is not the the the, the target you know um, uh checkbox exercises that is not the target we commit to the success of the team is very outcome driven yeah it's not just about you know getting getting things done for the sake of getting things done success is what we are going after we commit to doing scrum fully not just picking and choose choosing the easy parts okay so a lot of failures of product development that would tries to do scrum is because it becomes scrummy it becomes pick and choose scrum there's a reason why Scrum is a framework because all of these these uh, um, you know individual elements components are complementary to each other. So if you take out any any part of that and try to do Scrum, it doesn't generally work. So stick to Scrum. Okay, that's the commitment. We commit to continuously improve. Uh, we commit to continuous improvement and the courage to tweak and pivot based on new information or empirical data. We cannot predict or control all of the complexities in product development, but we can commit to taking actions and adjusting our behaviors based on feedback and new learnings. Yes. It's impossible to predict the future. And in a complex adaptive uh, you know, um, uh, uh, product uh, development, um, it's very impossible to have a complete upfront understanding of the customer through trial and error. The only way that we can find out about what the customer want. Yes. So we can take actions to get closer to that because we listen and we, 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 we take in new information. Okay. That's the whole point, point about Scrum. Yes. It's the, our ability of, to, to understand what we have control what we do how we do things and things that we don't have control you know the um you know all the complexities and in, in product development as i say yes separate that we commit to delivering value the product owner demonstrates commitment by making the best decisions to optimize the value of the product not simply trying to please every stakeholder yes okay it's about value this is not about pleasing you know internal stakeholders it's not really going through the motions yes it's about success the developers demonstrate commitment by creating an increment that meets their definition of done not something that is almost done almost done is not done the scrum master demonstrates commitment by upholding the scrum framework we commit to delivering a done increment Commitment to the product backlog is a commitment to transparency. Commitment to the sprint backlog is a commitment to transparency of our progress. Commitment to the daily scrum is an opportunity for the developers to demonstrate commitment to each other. Yes. So daily scrum, later on we will talk about that. It's 15 minutes, fixed time, fixed place. Yes. And you commit to making it to that the daily stand up and you commit not being late and you commit to finish it within 15 minutes very important because it's a commitment to each other you know you make yourself pre predictable through these kind of commitment and that really really uh, makes teamwork strong and then finally commitment to the sprint retrospective it's a commitment to continuous improvement as a team again a very strong lean concept embedded inside Scrum. 
Scrum values, respect. By respecting that people are naturally resourceful, creative, and capable of uh, collaboratively solving complex problems, we empower and enable self-managing teams. People are naturally resourceful. Let's believe in that. Yeah, That's the respect. When we respect that people are motivated by autonomy, mastery, and purpose, we create an environment that engages people and enables team to become greater than the sum of their parts. Yes, this completely ties into motivation theory. Um, for example, scholars like uh, Maslow, hierarchy of needs. Yes, self-actualization. Yes, this is professional mastery. Self-transcendence. Yes, this is really about doing the good for you know for 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 the collective good for for the whole yes scrum is about creating an environment to bring out these beautiful uh you know uh, motivations out of people when there is respect for all opinions and perspectives we can ensure everyone has the opportunity to be to be heard when we feel we have been heard it is possible to fully support team decisions even if the decision was not our preference. So I already spoke about this. Again, it's super important that we as a team develop this ability to support team decisions, even if the decision individually was not our preference. Okay. And the precondition to that is that everybody has been heard. The Scrum team is cross-functional, which means as a whole, it has all of the skills necessary to deliver a usable product increment. This promotes respect for everyone's experiences, skills, and ideas, and promotes learning and growth. Mm. So this, uh, you know, from, from uh, you know, the practicing uh, uh, Scrum part, when uh, the team formation part, it becomes a big question often. Do we, you know, we need to have uh, all of these people who have all of the complete skills? Mm. Truth is that you need to have a cross-functional team of learners. Because, you know, there's no way that we can, you know, know everything. Yes. But if you have a team of good learners and diverse abilities of learning different things, yes, each individual will be able to tap in uh, inside and outside the Scrum team's, you know, knowledge. And that's how we work. And that's what we mean as the Scrum team uh, as a whole has all the necessary skills to deliver. The sprint backlog is owned by the developers. Okay, this one you need to remember. The sprint backlog is owned by the developers. Okay, respect that the developers decide how much they can do in the sprint and how to do the work. Later on, we will touch this. It's up to the developers to decide what to do, how to do, and how much to do. By only reviewing product increment that meets the definition of definition of done in the sprint review, we bring transparency to our true progress. This demonstrates respect for our stakeholders. Yes, do not deliver crack and you know crap, unfinished uh, you know uh, flimsy stuff. Only verified um, you would definition of done completed work. Okay, it's the discipline. That's how we quality control in Scrum. The product owner seeks input from, from, collaborates with, and sets realistic expectations for stakeholders. This is another demonstration of respect for stakeholders. The Scrum Master is focused on the health of the Scrum team and the effective use of Scrum, having a role that focuses on teaching, facilitating, and coaching demonstrates a respect for people and team and their capacity for their growth. Yes. So a Scrum Master teaches, facilitates, and coaches. Scrum's focus on delivering value shows respect to our organization by not spending money on low value features or things that may never be used. Having a usable increment of value by the end of the sprint shows respect to our organization by not forcing more investment to realize value. It gives the organization the flexibility to make investment decision. So in waterfall, often cases, investment money is, it goes to waste because you know it's a fixed um, you know, deterministic process and you have to finish it. 
And therefore, even if you start having the gut feeling that, you know, people might not use it because of your organizational mandate, you do need to complete it. In Scrum, you don't have to uh, uh, complete it if it's the wrong thing, if you have evidence that it's the wrong thing to develop. Okay, that way you save the money. Yeah. And that's the respect that you pay to your sponsors. You know, you don't waste their money. Right. Meanwhile, if you finished it early, that's also respect there. You know, you move on, move on to the next, you know, value item. And again, you know, this this is about, you know, investment optimization, uh, helping helping your your stakeholders, your sponsors. That's respect. So that's the scrum values. Alrighty, now let's start looking into Scrum teams. This is part of me, the Scrum team. Okay. All right. The best way to to visualize, um, or one of the best ways to visualize the Scrum team is the Viking boat. I really, really like this analogy. Yes. So you have the Scrum team, which is the entire boat. Okay, and inside the Scrum team, you have the developers, you have the product owner. And you have the Scrum Master. The Scrum team consists of one Scrum Master, one product owner, and developers. Note that the developers used to be called development team. Yes. It's a change now. Um, previously, uh, the Scrum team had the development team and the Scrum Master and product owner. So there's a little bit of a feeling of a divide, Scrum Master, Product Owner versus Development Team, no more. The Scrum Team is the, inside there is the developers and the Scrum Master and the Product Owner, yeah. So from a Venn diagram perspective, there were two circles. Now there's just one big circle, right? Okay. So um, within the Scrum Team, which is typically 10 or few, fewer people, there are no sub teams or hierarchies. Okay, now this is another interesting one too. Ten or few fewer people. Okay, in Scrum Guide 2017, it was um, uh, up to nine development team members, uh, excluding the product owner and the Scrum Master. So technically, in the old guide, the Scrum team could have been up to 11 members if the product owner and the Scrum Master was not a developer. Yeah. So now it's a slight reduction because it's now up to 10 people for the whole thing. Okay. Personally, um, I like to stick to Miller's magic number seven plus minus two. Okay. Uh, the, this is a 1956 concept from a cognitive psychologist called George Miller. And I think you'll agree that seven plus uh, seven plus minus two. So five to nine people. This is probably the most comfortable and natural uh, you know, uh, size uh, for for us when we when we group and organize. Yes. So seven plus minus two, it correlates with the maximum ten people in the Scrum team. All right. So um, Scrum teams are cross-functional, meaning the members have all the skills necessary to create value uh, in each sprint. They are also self-managing, meaning they inter internally decide who does what, when, and how. So there's no separate manager. Okay, they just self-manage. Right. The entire Scrum team is accountable for creating a valuable, useful increment every sprint. Developers are the people in the Scrum team that are committed to creating any aspect of a usable increment each sprint and are accountable for instilling quality by adhering to a definition of done. Yes. So really, the you know Scrum um, across the years have been increasingly become popular with uh, um, you know non uh, programming teams, non IT teams. So the Scrum language language has been been evolving, uh, you know, uh, to to uh, to be really uh, encompassing of any type of uh, you know Scrum team. Okay, that's the reason why the developers are not just software developers. Developers are anybody that is committed to creating any aspect uh, of, of value, uh, you know, um, a usable increment uh, of value. Yeah. Product owner. The product owner is accountable for maximizing the value of the product resulting from the work of the Scrum team. Okay, so it's maximizing the value of the product resulting from the work of the Scrum team. It's very, very outcome product value focus. It's not about the Scrum and the product owner having a specific type of you know, activity. Yes, try to sense this nuance here. 
The Scrum Master is accountable for establishing Scrum as defined in the Scrum Guide. They do this by helping everyone understand Scrum theory and practice, both within the Scrum team and the organization. Yes, so Scrum, the Scrum Master is an evangelist. Yes, not only just, you know, not just uh, making, taking care of the Scrum Master, but also for the wider organization. Um, Scrum does not specify these roles as being full-time, part-time, etc. It is left out on purpose. Yes, this is a, a note that I personally put it put in because you know often cases there's discussion about do we need to have a dedicated Scrum team? Well, the Scrum guide does not answer that. Yes, I mean you know we have to use our 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 our, our business judgment, common sense as well. So yes, it is possible to have a Scrum time where people are part-time. But we do need to have you have to make pragmatic considerations against that, because even if it's a part time team, you still have to do your daily stand ups. You still have to maintain all you know all of the commitments that have been outlined in in this in the Scrum Guide. So, why do we work as a Scrum team? Well, if we are a team of no developers, we're not going to go anywhere. If you are a team with no product owner, nobody telling us which direction, nobody showing us the North Star, we'll go all over the place. Yeah, we'll be lost. Yeah, it's such a waste. Yeah. Um, if you are a team with no Scrum Master, no one to teach us how to how to ride this complex adaptive boat, we might uh, you know hit hit uh, hit uh, rough waters. You know shallow shallow, shallow stones. You know rocks. Um, and yeah, we, we might not make it to our destination. So we need to have a good scrum master that will guide us um, you know, on, on how, to, how to run our boat, okay? So finally, if it's a full scrum team, yes, we will be able to make the most efficient way of uh, you know, uh, a passage in our journey to reach our destination, our final product uh, you know, goal. Alrighty, developers. Okay, developers are, let's, let's look at each of the roles, okay, from here. Developers are the people in the Scrum team that are committed to creating any aspect of a usable in increment each sprint. The specific skills needed by the developers are often broad and will vary with the domain of work. However, the developers are always accountable for creating a plan for the sprint, the sprint backlog. Yes, the sprint backlog is a plan for the sprint and the developers are accountable for that. Instilling quality by adhering to definition of done. So DOD, definition of done, is a, a, a quality control mechanism and we, we abide to that and the developers are accountable for that. Adopting their plan each day toward the sprint goal and holding each other accountable as professionals. So each day, professionalism every day, yes. Scrum is a daily activity. So the evolutionary path of the developers, I just love this visual, yes. In 1965, psychologist Bruce Tuckman came up with a model of five stages of group development, forming, storming, norming, performing, and then journey. In fact, in Scrum, you see this clear pattern, and it's really the Scrum Master's job to help coach the team to go through this process effectively. And it's no easy feat, even for a professional behavioral coach like me. Okay? So in the beginning, you group, and then you have your storming phase. Yes, And during this storming phase, you have a temporary reduction in productivity. It's called the J-curve effect, or, or the hockey stick. Yes. So be prepared. You know, once you form, yes, there will be a storming phase and, you know, it will be a little bit chaotic. Yeah. But persevere, you know, carry on. Every scrum team in the beginning will go through this temporary loss of productivity. It's necessary. That's how we group. OK. And then the team will start, uh, you know, uh, for forming. OK. And, um, you know, and when it forms, okay, um, it can form nice and cozy, all right? 
acting like a family that's that's really good not bad not bad you know sometimes the team temperature is is low so they will norm you know sort of like not as strong but if you're a family yeah that's not bad that's not bad but the best type of teams the most high performing and you know uh, performance type of teams act like a wolf pack Yeah, you know, everybody is driven. Everybody is really going after something. So when you become a, you know, scrum team, yeah, when you go through your forming, storming, norming, and performing stages, really try to form, uh, you know, form a norm at this very, very high performance level. Try to become a wolf pack. Okay, the product owner. The product owner is accountable for maximizing the value of the product resulting from the work of the scrum team. How this is done may vary widely across organizations, scrum teams, and individuals. The product owner is, is also accountable for effective product backlog management, which includes, okay? So the product backlog, right? This is owned by the product owner, and the product owner is accountable for maintaining the product backlog. Developing and explicitly communicating the product goal. creating and clearly communicating product backlog items, ordering product backlog items, and ensuring that the product backlog is transparent, visible, and understood. The product owner may do the above work or may delegate the responsibility to the others. Regardless, the product owner remains accountable. Okay. So in real practice, the product owner, of course, will be involving, um, you know, uh, um, the, the, the developers in building the product backlog because, you know, we, the product owner needs information. Um, the developers, uh, you know, are, are most akin to, uh, you know, knowing both the what and the how. So their information is more, most important. Okay. And often cases, you know, the product owner will delegate, uh, you know, populating the product you know, backlog and prioritizing it. But... At the end of the day, it is accountability of the product uh, you know, owner for all of these things, even if he has the help from the developers. For product owner to succeed, the entire organization must respect their decisions. These decisions are visible in the content and ordering of the product backlog and through the inspectable increment at the sprint review. <clears throat> It's often the case that the product owner is simply a proxy. And, um, and although the product owner is respons responsible for a development of a specific product line, yes, um, you know, it's often cases, uh, you know, the, the product owner does not have the full power of launching it and investing, uh, you know, in, in, in a very flexible way of growing that product. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very sad phenomenon that ha happens on, you know, often in large organizations. So explicitly, the entire organization must respect the product owner. Yes, if we're gonna empower the product owner, give the product owner power. Product owner is one person, not a committee. The product owner may represent the needs of many stakeholders in the product backlog. Those wanting to change the product backlog can do so by trying to convince the product owner. Yes. There's only one product owner. There's only one owner. If there are a lot of people, ownership is dispersed. So we only want to have one product owner and really give the product owner ownership of the product, please. The evolutionary path of the product owner. I can't emphasize enough that if the product owner acts like a boss in the old leader follower way, the scrum team will fail. Or if the product owner just acts like a middle manager passing on instructions from above, the developers won't take the product owner seriously. Okay, so don't so um, don't be just a scribe or a proxy. at least be a good business representative that's an effective voice of the customers and stakeholders. But even more powerful if, is if the product owner can be a sponsor of the Scrum Team's endeavor, yes? And ultimately, I coach product owners to try to see the Scrum as a startup enterprise and, and, the, start, and, the, and, the, and the product himself as a startup entrepreneur driving the startup, startup business. 
this is going to be the most powerful type of product owners there, okay? So product owners that are super weak, simply being a scribe and a proxy, not good enough. And then the wrong type of product owner, a product owner that acts like a boss instructing, okay, that kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, role does not exist in Scrum, but rather the Scrum, okay. Okay, default, at best, representing the business uh, interest of various stakeholders, customers, so on. So somebody that is very balanced and is able to communicate that, but even better, a sponsor and an entrepreneur. Yes, product owners are really, really important. Often cases, it becomes the make it or break it. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the power of the drive really de uh, of the scrum team really depends on the product owner. Okay, scrum master. So understand that scrum master has a big role to play in scrum. So this slide is going to be loaded. It's going to be very long, hang on with me, okay? The scrum master is accountable for establishing scrum as defined in the scrum guide. They do this by helping everyone understand Scrum theory and practice, both within the Scrum team and the organization. The Scrum master is accountable for the Scrum team's effectiveness. They do this by enabling the Scrum team to improve its practices within the Scrum framework. Scrum masters are true leaders who serve the Scrum team and the larger organization. Note the word serve together with leader, servant leader. The Scrum Master serves the Scrum team in several ways, including coaching the, the, the team members in self-management and cross-functionality, helping the Scrum team focus on creating high-value increments that meet the definition of done, so making sure that people follow the discipline, causing the removal of impediments, yeah, so blockers, all right? Uh, to the scrum team's progress so causing the removal all right so sometimes the scrum master and uh, you know himself won't be able to remove it but he will be able to instigate actions that will make that will make the removal happen ensuring that all scrum events take place and are positive productive and kept within the time box yes so this is a part it's not managing okay it's ensuring yeah all right, so Scrum Master coaches, make sure that, that these, these uh, events are done properly, okay? But it's not the Scrum Master's job to, uh, you know, manage and organize, uh, you know, all of these events uh, you know, and, and so on and so forth. No, that self-managing part is the Scrum team. The Scrum Master serves the product owner in several ways, including helping find techniques for effective product goal definition and product backlog management. Yes. Setting a product goal is very difficult. Managing uh, the product backlog takes experience. It, there, is a technical, uh, there is a technique element too. So the Scrum Master will really, really help uh, you know, the, the, the product owner on these two fronts. Helping the Scrum team understand the need for clear and concise product backlog items. Clear and concise, okay? Because remember, the product backlog is a list. It's an ordered list. Helping establish empirical product planning for a complex environment. Again, yes, uh, empirical process control. Facilitating stakeholder collaboration as requested or needed. And the Scrum Master serves the org organization in several ways, including, yes? So remember this, the Scrum Master serves the Scrum team, the product owner, yes? And the entire organization. Leading, training, and coaching the organization in its Scrum adoption, so evangelizing. Planning and advising Scrum implementations within the organization. Mm -hmm. So synchronizing, integrating, yes? Helping employees and stakeholders understand and enact an empirical approach for complex work. Yes. So um, waterfall is predictive planning. So you predict to the future 18 months later. Yeah. But meanwhile, um, the spirit of Agile is, is really evidence-based. So where we can, the Scrum Master tries to start instigating the culture of evidence-based management and empiricism, you know, even outside of the Scrum team. 
removing barriers between stakeholders and scrum teams. Yes, okay, communication means impediments. Let's remove that, no barriers. The evolutionary path of the scrum master. Yes, again, the scrum master is not a manager, okay? Understandably, this is one of the biggest behavior change struggles that former, former project managers struggling struggle in becoming a scrum master yes actually many project managers don't recognize that a scrum master is quite a different job okay because again scrum master is not a manager remember that okay so scrum masters don't be just a clerk never be a puppet master dishing out do this do that you know instructions okay and get out of the job of being an organizer for the scrum team all right you're not a manager all right okay so be a coach advisor and an expert on how to do scrum all righty next scrum framework events let's start with the sprint the sprint, often overlooked, but the sprint is itself an event in the Scrum framework. It is a container event for all other events, yes? Sprints are the heartbeat of Scrum, where ideas are turned into value. They are fixed length events of one month or less to create consistency. A new sprint starts immediately after the conclusion of the previous sprint. Okay, so what is this saying? Saying a couple things. You know, number one is saying that a, a sprint is maximum one month. Okay, in practice, typically it's two weeks, sometimes even shorter, one week. All right, and the second thing is that after sprint review, sprint retro, when sprint retro finishes, the next sprint immediately starts. So you immediately go into sprint planning. All right. Now, in practical terms, you know, most most sprint, uh, you know, uh, last day of sprints happen on Friday. So you get the weekend off and then you have a fresh start on Monday. OK, so so, um, you know, it's it's simply a matter of, you know, for for business days, you know, it's just a continuous uh, you know, way of doing it. All right. OK, so. Um, all right, here we go. All the work necessary to achieve the product goal, including sprint planning, daily scrum, sprint reviews, and sprint retrospective, happen within sprints. Okay, again, scrum sprint is a container event. During the sprint, no changes are made that will endanger the sprint goal. Quality does not decrease. The product backlog is refined as needed, and scope may be clarified and renegotiated with the product owner as more is learned. Yes. So, so after sprint planning and the sprint goal is fixed, you go into doing mode. So while you do adapt the plan during the sprint, such as refining the product backlog as needed and clarifying and renegotiating the scope with the product owner, that doesn't mean you get to make changes of magnitude that will affect the sprint goal. Okay, so that's the part where no changes are made that, uh, that would endanger the sprint goal. Okay, all right. Sprints enable predictability by ensuring inspection and adaptation of progress toward a product goal at least every calendar month. So again, maximum of one month, all right? And, and you know, and if it's two week sprints, this uh, um, ensuring inspection and adaptation of progress toward a product goal, you know, is within two weeks, okay? Shorter sprints can be employed to generate more learning cycles and limit risk of cost and effort to a smaller time frame. Each sprint may be considered a short project. Okay, so Scrum does use the the, the project language if you want. Okay, okay, but it's not a waterfall project. You know, it's not eighteen months. It's two week project. Okay, that's 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 the important part, or one month, or depending on your cadence of your sprint. A sprint could be canceled if the sprint goal becomes obsolete. Only the product owner has the authority to cancel the sprint. This is a really, really uh, important point and actually a very rare point. Um, 
Uh, I actually have not experienced a sprint being canceled, um, you know, um, because of the sprint goal becoming obsolete. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very rare thing. But it can happen. You know, sometimes you're developing a product. Um, um, sometimes you're developing a feature or function. And because of external events, all of a sudden that, that uh, you know, is, is, is no longer, um, you know, in, in the need. There's no more market need. Well, if you continue developing the product just for the sake of completing it, that's complete waste. So that's the reason why, um, you know, uh, we do have the ability to cancel a sprint. Yeah, because, you know, that's reality too. Okay, next one, sprint planning. Sprint planning is a big event, all right? It's a maximum of eight hours for one month sprint. And for two weeks sprints, it's typically four hours. So it's a heavy, heavy, heavy uh, um, you know, event, all right? Sprint planning initiates the sprint by laying out the work to be performed for the sprint. This, res this resulting plan is created by the collaborative work of the entire scrum team okay so sprint planning is done by the entire scrum team the product owner ensures that that attendees are prepared to discuss the most important product backlog items and how they map to the product goal the scrum team may also invite other people to attend sprint planning to provide advice okay so again it's the product owner that's going to ensure sprint planning takes place okay uh, i mean and it's, it's done properly okay now um typically sprint planning is done only with the scrum team but if there is a need for a subject matter expert if there is a need for uh, certain types of you know very mission critical input yes exceptionally you can invite other people outside of the scrum team to join the sprint plan Sprint planning. Sprint planning addresses the following topics. Okay, so this is something that is uh, um, uh, new to to uh, um, Scrum Guide 2020. They became a little bit more clarifying on how to do sprint planning because, as you can see, in the our event it's actually quite big. Topic one: Why is a sprint? Uh, why is this sprint valuable? The product owner proposes how the product could increase its value and utility in the current sprint. The whole Scrum team then collaborates to define a sprint goal that communicates why the sprint is valuable to stakeholders. The sprint goal must be finalized prior to the end of sprint planning. Topic two, what can be done this sprint? Through discussion with the product owner, the developers Okay, it's the developers, yes. The developers select items from the product backlog to include in the current sprint. The Scrum team may refine these items during this process, which increases understanding and confidence, yes. So you can do backlog refinement, you know, in sprint planning because it's an ongoing process, yes. Okay, but do uh, come with a, a, yeah, a refined backlog, you know, um, you know, don't, don't come with a messy uh, product backlog because it, it will it will really add time to to sprint planning. Okay. Um, in selecting how much can be completed within the sprint, the developers forecast the sprint by considering their past performance, their upcoming capacity and their definition of done. Okay, so it's the developers. Who will be deciding, you know, how much work to be that can be done, and selecting, you know, what work, right? And of course, this is the developers, um, you know, uh, flexibility for uh, deciding how to, uh, you know, um, uh, develop that particular increment. How will the Trojan work get done? For each selected product backlog item, the developer plans the work necessary to create an increment that meets the definition of done. This is often done by decomposing product backlog items into smaller work items of one day or less. How this is done is the sole discretion of the developers. No one else tells them how to turn product backlog items into increments of value. So it's up to the developer on how to develop that increment. Okay. Also notice uh, this decomposing product backlog items. Yes. So later on, 
after Scrum Theory, I would be talking about Scrum practices. And the often, often uh, practiced uh, thing in Scrum is grouping tasks into stories and grouping stories into epics. Yes. So the so you break it down into smaller pieces. So not just you know a long list of tasks, but it's broken down of something of a higher objective. Okay. This is a technique that uh, a practice that we use in Scrum. Alrighty. So what's next? Hey. Daily Scrum. The purpose of the Daily Scrum is to inspect progress toward the sprint goal and adopt the sprint backlog as necessary, adjusting the upcoming planned work. The Daily Scrum is a 15-minute event for the developers of the Scrum team. Take note, okay? It's not for the Scrum team, it's for the developers. To reduce complexity, it is held at the same time and place every working day of the sprint. If the product owner or scrum master are actively working on items in the sprint backlog, they participate as developers. All right. So, if the there's you know the product owner and the scrum master can join, yes. Um, and if they are um, you know developers themselves, they actively join. Okay. But if they are not developers, they are just product owners and scrum masters. They let the developers self-manage the daily standup. All right. Okay. And the daily standup needs to be exactly at the same time. So a technique that I often use is that you know instead of saying uh, you know uh, uh, 845 to, to uh, you know 9 a.m. for daily standup, use an odd time like 843 to 858 you know a.m. You know, that way people will, will make sure that they are there and start promptly on time and, you know, and, and use other other ways, ways of, you know, making sure that, you know, everybody will, will go through, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, the daily stand up um, every day at the same time. Okay. The developers can select whatever structure and technique they want as long as their daily scrum focuses on progress toward the sprint goal and produce an actionable plan for the next day of work. This creates focus and improves self-management. So you probably already know that often cases scrum, uh, daily scrums, uh, daily standups are done in the form of what I did yesterday, uh, you know, uh, what I plan to do today, and you know what what impediments there are. Hmm? It's a good practice, but you don't have to do it that way. Okay. So scrum, the, uh, the scrum guy is very explicit about that part. You know, you could be creative, adjust it to your team's reality. Daily Scrum improves communication, identify impediments, promote quick decision making, and consequently eliminate the need for other meetings. Yes. So sync up meetings, no need. Just do it on daily stand up and keep it 15 minutes. Yes. And then spend the rest of the time. You know, the team will probably meet together during the day for other purposes, but that just focus on particular contents, particular activities. And for the syncing up, just use a daily standup, okay? It removes the need for, for, for those kind of coordination meetings. The daily scrum is not the only time developers are allowed to adjust their plan. They often meet throughout the day for more detailed discussions about adapting or replanning the rest of the sprint work. Okay, sprint review. Okay, so day one, sprint, uh, uh, sprint planning, okay? Day two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, development. Day 10, sprint review, sprint retrospective. Sprint review. The purpose of the sprint review is to inspect the outcome of the sprint and determine future adaptations. The Scrum team presents the results of their work to key stakeholders and progress toward the product goal is discussed. Discussed, okay? Inspect determine, present, discussed, okay? Note that it's not just demoing, all right? It's beyond presenting. You do discussions, you do deciding, you do inspection. Yeah. Sprint review is for that purpose. During the event, the Scrum team and stakeholders review what was accomplished in the sprint and what has changed in their environment. Based on this information, attendees collaborate on what to do next. The product backlog may also be adjusted to meet new opportunities. The sprint view is a working session 
and the Scrum team should avoid limiting it, limiting it to a presentation. It's a working session. Attendees collaborate on what to do next. You have your stakeholders, sometimes your customers involved. Collaborate with them. It's a working session with them. This is not just a demo day. The sprint review is the second to last event of the sprint and is time boxed to a maximum of four hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. So it is again, still a heavy, heavy um, you know, meeting. Um, for a one month sprint, it's a half a day event. For a two week sprint, it's still around two hours. So it's fairly, fairly heavy, okay? Definitely, um, you know, sprint reviews uh, in one hour, mm, a bit short, yeah, a bit light. You can't really go deep in the in the inspecting and the discussion and the deciding parts, yeah? And al also, you really want to get inputs, yeah? Um, this is a, an opportunity for stakeholders to make requests, um, you know, for, for the next iteration of features, functions, etc. okay? So, make sure that you allocate sufficient time uh, you know um uh, for 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 sprint review finally sprint retrospective the purpose of the sprint retrospective is to plan ways to increase quality and effectiveness so the sprint review is the end of sprint what meeting the sprint retrospective is the end of sprint how meeting the scrum team inspects how the last sprint went with regards to individuals, interactions, processes, tools, and the definition of done, okay? So if the definition of done was loose or was not functioning, talk about that, okay? Inspected elements often vary with domain of work. Assumptions that led them astray are identified and their origins explored. The Scrum team discusses what went well during the sprint, what problems it encountered and how those problems were or were not solved yes so be very very um you know uh exploratory and tangible work on real problems um you know uh that that you're encountering celebrate the things that uh, you know um you know have have been going well and even better if things you have been able to fix celebrate that too recognize that too the Scrum team identifies the most helpful changes to improve its effectiveness. The most impactful improvements are addressed as soon as possible. They may even be added to the sprint backlog for the next sprint. Okay. This is a change from Scrum Guide 2017. In the Scrum Guide 2017, it was mandatory to select at least one um, you know, uh, product backlog item for improving the how. In the 2020 Scrum Guide, it became less, uh, less prescriptive. So now it's a choice. But nonetheless, it's still very encouraged to find at least one, uh, you know, improvement item on, you know, uh, on uh, interactions, processes, tools, etc. Yes. So it's still encouraged, but no longer mandatory. Okay. Careful, careful on this on, on, the, uh, on the certification exam. The sprint retrospective concludes the sprint. It is time boxed to a maximum of three hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. So for a two week sprint, usually it's about 19 minutes. Okay, finally, Scrum artifacts. Scrum artifacts. Scrum's artifacts represent work or value, okay? It's work or value. They are designed to maximize transparency of key information. Thus, everyone expect inspecting them has the same basis for adaptation. Yes. So it needs to be transparent. It needs to be consistently communicated. Each artifact contains a commitment to ensure it provides information that enhances transparency and focus against which progress can be measured. These commitments exist to reinforce empiricism and the Scrum values for the Scrum team and their stakeholders. Okay, so these are the ar artifacts, and there are three of them. Let's start with the product backlog. The product backlog is an emergent ordered list of what is needed to improve the product. It is the single source of work undertaken by the Scrum team. So 
quite a few things here. First, it's a list and it's ordered. And the nature of this list is that it, it, it's emergent. As new information comes in, the product backlog grows. Okay? And it's about what is needed to improve the product. Okay? So it's about improvement. It's a single source of work. All right? So anything that you are developing uh, you know, for this product, if it's not on the product backlog, something's wrong. So make sure it's captured on the product backlog. Product backlog items that can be done by the Scrum team within one sprint are deemed ready for selection in a sprint planning event. So if there is a big, big product backlog item, you've got to break it down and fit it into one sprint. Then it's ready for selection. They usually acquire this degree of transparency after refining activities. What is refining? Product backlog refinement is the act of breaking down and further defining product backlog items into smaller, more precise items. This is an ongoing activity to add details such as description, order, and size. Attributes often vary within the domain of work. Again, the Scrum Guide is be trying to be as accommodating as possible for non uh, software programming, uh, you know, a software development type of application of Scrum. The developers who will be doing the work are responsible for the sizing. Sizing, yes. The product owner may influence the developers by helping them understand and select trade-offs. We'll look at sizing later on, uh, you know, in the Scrum practicing part. The product goal is the commitment for the product backlog. The product goal describes a future state of the product which can serve as a target for the Scrum team to plan against. The product goal is inside, is in the product backlog. The rest of the product backlog emerges to define what will fulfill the product goal. Yes. So the product goal is literally the goal. It's the future state, your vision of what you want to build, what you want to develop. A product is a vehicle to deliver value. It has a clear boundary, known stakeholders, well-defined users or customers. A product could be a service, a physical product, or something more abstract. Yes. This is a very, very powerful definition. A product is a vehicle to deliver value. And therefore, it can be a service because it doesn't have to be a physical thing, yes? And as a matter of fact, you know, um, I'm in organization development, OD. Sometimes I do full organization interventions. And in those kind of things, I see the organization as a vehicle to deliver value. There's complete truth in that, right? So in this case, in organization development, the organization itself is the product. Yes. It has clear boundaries, it has known stakeholders, and it's well -defined, it has well-defined users of customers. Yes, a company, an organization, often can be seen as a whole product. Yes. So you can do Scrum on organization development. The product goal is the long-term objective for the Scrum team. They must fulfill one object, uh, fulfill or abandon one objective before taking on the next. Okay, one at a time. Now, product backlog, sprint, sprint backlog. The sprint backlog is composed of the sprint goal. Why? The set of product backlog items selected for the sprint. What? As well as an actionable plan for del delivering the increment. How? Yes. So uh, the sprint backlog is a subset of the product backlog, and it's very, very action-oriented. Why, what, and how? The sprint backlog is a plan by and for the developers. It is a highly visible, real-time picture of the work that the developers plan to accomplish during the sprint in order to achieve the sprint goal. Consequently, the sprint backlog is updated throughout the sprint as more is learned. It should have enough detail that they can inspect their progress in the daily scrum. 
Okay. So while the uh, while the spirit of sprint planning is to plan out for the whole two weeks, if it's a two week sprint, okay. As you develop, there is always going to be the possibility of learning new things. Like, for example, you do a customer testing and something comes out. You are you were developing a certain type of you know technology, you know, um, and that is that is um. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, you know, you find a better technology, you know, things like that. If that is the case, yes, as long as the sprint goal stays stable, you have the ability to, uh, um, you know, adapt the sprint backlog. The sprint goal is the commitment for the sprint backlog. The sprint goal is a single objective for the sprint. Although the sprint goal is a commitment by the developers, it provides flexibility in terms of the exact work needed to achieve it. This is a key thing. The sprint goal is, is fixed, stable, but how to achieve that sprint goal? Developers have the full freedom. Okay, you may adapt. The sprint goal also creates coherence and focus, encouraging the Scrum team to work together rather than on separate initiatives. Yes, because everybody is unified under the sprint goal. That's the key thing. The sprint goal is created during the sprint planning event and then added to the sprint backlog. As the developers work during the sprint, they keep the sprint goal in mind. If the work turns out to be different than they expected, they collaborate with the product owner to negotiate the scope of the sprint backlog within the sprint without affecting the sprint goal. So sprint goal stays, but the scope of the work can change. And and then finally, an interesting concept. Yes, an increment is an artifact. An increment is an artifact, right? An increment is a concrete stepping stone toward the product goal. Each increment is additive to all prior increments and thoroughly verified, ensuring that all increments work together, okay? In order to provide value, the increment must be usable. Multiple increments may be created within the sprint. The sum of the increment is presented at the sprint review, thus supporting empiricism, evidence-based management. Increments, if it clears the definition of done, there is um, a, a correct testing criteria in a way, yeah, uh, verifying criteria that it creates value. Okay, that's the reason why it supports empiricism. However, an increment may be delivered to stakeholders prior to the end of the sprint. Yes, the sprint review should never be considered a gate to releasing value. Okay, so using the word gate, a gateway, this is a waterfall language. And, you know, there's also often confusion that uh, the, the sprint review is like a waterfall, uh, you know, release, uh, waterfall like, uh, you know, uh, release event. No, no. It's really up to um, you know the, the the product owner um, to decide whether or not to release an increment, and you're all, you're okay to do that. Um, you know even before sprint review. Definition of done is the commitment for the increment. The definition of done is a formal description of the state of the increment when it meets the quality measures required for the product. Work cannot be considered part of the increment unless it meets the definition of done. The moment a product backlog item meets the definition of done, an increment is born. Yes. So all artifacts, okay? The Scrum Guide 2020 has made it explicit that it's paired with a commitment, okay? Product backlog has its product goal as its commitment. Sprint backlog has its sprint goal as its commitment. And for the increment, the commitment is definition of done. The definition of done creates transparency by providing everyone a shared understanding of what work was completed as part of the increment. If a product backlog item does not meet the definition of done, it cannot be released or even presented by the sprint review. Instead, it returns to the product backlog for future consideration. Remember the courage part? Yes. You, you need to have the courage to not deliver, deliver um, unfinished uh, you know, work. So definition of done, very, very important here. If the definition of done for an increment is part of the standards of the organization, all Scrum teams must follow it as a minimum. If it is not an or 
organizational standard, the Scrum team must create a definition of done appropriate for the product. Yes. So this will show up, uh, you know, in the in the certification exam. So take note. Yes. How you know who decides the definition of done? If it already exists in the organization, you got to follow that. If not, it's the Scrum team. Okay, it's the Scrum team that creates the definition of done. Okay, remember the Scrum team? It's the developers, product owner, and the Scrum master all together. The developers are required to conform to the definition of done. If there are multiple Scrum teams working together on a product, they must mutually define and comply with the same definition of done. Okay, so um, although in the Scrum crash course, I won't be covering scale, um, Scrum at scale, scaled Scrum. Yes, it is uh, you know part of your certification process. So you will do ha have to do some individual reading on that part. But in you know in that, uh, what it explains is that you know you will be having um, you know a situation where multiple Scrum teams share one product backlog. Yes, in that case, the definition of done needs to be absolutely consistent. So this is what it is talking about. This, uh, all of the Scrum teams need to mutually define, define and comply with that that uh, um, that uh, uh, consensus definition of that. All right. Okay. Good. Okay. Last piece of the Scrum framework: the Scrum rules. The Scrum rules aren't really explicitly, uh, you know, um, mentioned or defined in the Scrum Guide 2020. So it's often overlooked um, as, as uh, you know, not part of the framework, but it is, it's very important. In the Scrum Guide 2017, the Scrum rules was rather explicitly um, uh, um, explained. Yeah? It went as following. The rules of Scrum bind together the roles, events, and artifacts, governing the relationships and interactions between them. The rules of Scrum are described throughout the body of the Scrum Guide. So the Scrum Guide itself is a Scrum, Scrum rules. That's, that's what uh, Scrum Guide 2017 was, was, uh, uh, was suggesting. In Scrum Guide 2020, that line has been removed. So it's not as obvious. Nonetheless, if you look at the title of the Scrum Guide, it goes, the Scrum Guide, the Definitive Guide to Scrum, the Rules of the Game. So Scrum rules are still there. So please take note of that, okay? So that's the reason why I decided to include it back into uh, one of the important elements. As a matter of fact, the, it's, it's uh, the whole thing of the Scrum framework, yes, okay. Okay, then there are a couple other other things, okay, first, Specific tactics for using the Scrum framework vary and are described elsewhere. So there's this concept called Scrum and, yes. So um, Scrum uses many complementary practices and I will, I will be uh, describing that uh, in the next se section, Scrum practices. But within Scrum theory, okay, many of these practices are not explained, okay? It's not part of the Scrum rule. Okay, so take take note of that. What's inside uh, the Scrum Scrum rule, Scrum guide, and many of the things that we actually do in Scrum, but defined elsewhere. Okay, separate those two things. All right. Okay. The Scrum framework, as outlined herein, is immutable. While implementing only parts of Scrum is possible, the result is not Scrum. Scrum exists only in its entirety. Okay. So you can do just daily stand-ups, you can just do sprints, but unless you do Scrum as a whole, following the full rules, you cannot call it Scrum. It might be Scrummy, okay? Um, and you know, it might still work, um, but not as powerful and functional as Scrum. So if you're going to do Scrum, do it properly. Notice that Scrum is capital, A, capital S Scrum. And to do capital S Scrum, you have to follow the Scrum rules, okay? Um, lastly, uh, Scrum exists only in its entirety and functions well as a container for other techniques, methodologies, and practices. So it's the same, same as the last line of uh, Scrum Guide 2017. Specific tactics for using the Scrum framework vary and are described elsewhere. So there's a concept called Scrum But and Scrum And. Scrum But 
is modified Scrum. You know, uh, we do Scrum, but we don't do this part. Okay, that's no longer Scrum. Okay, it might be Scrummy, but not Scrum. Okay, so you can't call it Scrum. All right. Then Scrum and Scrum and other practices. For example, I combine Scrum with design thinking. Okay, but I still follow the very strict you know, Scrum rules. Yes. So in this case, it's Scrum and design thinking. So Scrum but, Scrum but, no. Scrum and, yes. That concludes Scrum theory. Um, and uh, uh, we will very briefly talk about Scrum practices now. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about the certification process, particularly with Scrum.org. Okay. So now let's talk about uh, practicing Scrum. Uh, the additional tools, the things that are not necessarily defined and made mandatory in the Scrum Guide that we actually uh, use as Scrum practices. Okay, so quick summary, um, sprint, how it works. Um, if it's a Monday to the following Friday, Monday is going to be the sprint planning, okay? Before sprint planning, make sure that your product backlog is already refined, right? Otherwise, you'll be spending a lot of extra time on uh, sprint planning um, and getting your, your sprint backlog in order, okay? Instead of discussing, you know, uh, you, uh, what, what uh, you know, more contents, more, more, uh, more understanding of, uh, you know, what you can do in this, in this current sprint, okay? So once you finish your, um, you, once you have your product, uh, your, your sprint backlog ready, sprint goal is, is, is uh is defined you're ready to you know you you, you will start your doing your sprint uh you know development okay so the developments are going to be from the second day third fourth fifth sixth seventh eighth and ninth day all right and each day you will do a daily scrum it's 15 minutes now of course you don't just do daily scrum you actually do the development so you'll be spending a lot of time individually and collaboratively most likely even more collaboratively because scrum is meant for collaboration okay and those will continue for eight days and the final tenth day is a sprint review and the sprint retro okay and then you close the sprint celebrate learn recognize and then you open up the next sprint immediately afterwards okay so this is the cadence all right Okay, so far this is, uh, is still still within Scrum rules, all right? Okay, and therefore if you visualize it, this is how it's going to look. You have your backlog, you, um, you know, to be more precise, it's your product backlog and your sprint backlog, uh, sprint planning, um, uh, then you have your daily Scrum, um, then you have your sprint review and sprint retrospective, and that concludes the sprint, you immediately go into the next sprint, okay? This is a visualization, still, still within the Scrum theory, okay? Now, this is an example of what is a, uh, a scrum scrum uh, you know um, practice and uh, not necessarily um, you know something that is mandated inside the scrum guide yes the scrum guide uh, does talk about ordering the product backlog and making big items smaller and fitting um, you know uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, fitting backlog items that can fit in one day to be ready uh, to be picked into the sprint backlog. So it does talk about that, okay? In practice, we use jargons like epic story and task, okay? This is not defined in the Scrum Guide, but it is a practice and a common language that we use, okay? The smallest unit of work is tax, a task. A collection of tasks is the stories. The collection of stories is the epic, okay? This is how, this is how we group, group, group. And it's it's a very smart uh, way way of uh, um, you know uh, of, of controlling very complex big item of things into uh, executable uh, chunks of work, all right. And then we also have another another um, uh, a great tool called user stories. As a user, I want to do whatever whatever so that whatever whatever values are are realized. This is a very very good way of writing stories. Okay, and once you have that as your target, breaking that into tasks becomes much easier. Okay. All right, um, sizing. Yes, that is something that has been mentioned in the Scrum theory, the Scrum guide. Okay, now how do you actually do that? Yes, uh, a good practice is called um, uh, um, is it is called uh, estimation with story points, okay? But it's not mandatory, yes. Um, 
it's a quite difficult technique because you know in the very beginning when you don't have uh, data of the productivity of the team it's very difficult to estimate the story point um, you know what is a good story point because everything is relative there so you know typically teams will first have to start with sizing with how much time it's going to take and then later on, when they start are, are able to say start seeing that you know their productivity is in, increasing, i.e. they get to do more work in one unit of time, yes, then they start using story points. Okay, so instead of using time, they use story points. Story points, um, you know, uh, show is, is is in the form of difficulty, and if you can do more difficult work in a shorter and less amount of time. That's a productivity increase. That's the reason why you use story points. Okay, and it's it's a difficult practice. You know, and this is something that it's hard to explain. Um, you know, but but easy. You know, uh, once you start practicing, get a, get a hang of it, and you know, it's very easy to follow. Planning po poker using modified Fibonacci sequence. That again is another practice that we use in estimating. Uh, you know, product PBIs, product backlog items with story points. Okay, t-shirt sizes are another another great way of doing that. Okay, so a burn down chart. Yes, there is no mentioning of the word velocity inside the Scrum Guide, but in Scrum practice, we do use velocity. Is the is the team you know speeding up? What does speeding up means? It means the team is becoming more productive. It means that the team at a fixed time, you only have two weeks, and that is fixed times. You know, eight hours a day times uh, 10 business days, that's 80 hours, you know, per person. And time doesn't stretch or shrink. So within that, you know, that 80 hours per person times, you know, whatever number of the, uh, the, the development team members, your total amount of time that you can do as a team, okay? If you can do more work inside, in, you know, within that fixed amount of time, your productivity is improving. How do you capture that? Yes, that's often... Uh, by 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 using a burn down chart, so you are capturing capturing how much story points you have been able to uh, you know take care of, execute, deliver you know um, with the definition of done you know the increments that that you deliver all right um, and um, and then you 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 measure that against your estimated burn down and your actual burn down okay and you keep on seeing if your velocity is increasing any given unit of time have you been able to do more story points. Okay, so you keep on challenging every sprint, every sprint to do more story points. Sprint, you know, 10 was, uh, you know, 80 story points as, as a team. Sprint, uh, you know, 11, we challenged ourselves to do 85 and we estimated for 85, uh, we, but we were able to do 87. Great, you know, you overachieved. So with that, uh, you know, in mind, sprint 12, we decided to go for story 90 story points. This time we only were able to do 89 story points, okay? But getting closer to that, this is how you measure your velocity, your productivity. And that's what we use the burn down charts for. Okay, uh, Kanban board. Yes, so the product backlog and the sprint backlog needs to be visualized and ordered and needs to be in the list format. Kanban comes from lean. Um, it's Japanese. It literally means board. Yeah. So it's a visualized board. Um, so, um, you know, it started from, uh, you know, a Toyota factory. Yes. And um, um, it's, it's a way of communicating uh, where, where everybody's work is. So it's a communication board. Typically, it's done in the fashion of to do, work in progress, and done. Now, this is the sprint backlog, current stuff. What's unique of the Kanban board using in Scrum is that the backlog, the product backlog, okay, is added to it. So you have the sprint backlog and the product backlog in the same Kanban board. So it's a big, big Kanban board, okay? Often cases, it's in com combination, it's called the Scrum board, all right? So again, that's something not defined in the Scrum guide, but it's a common practice. The Kanban board is used, uh, you know, in in, in 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 many ways. You modify it according to your needs. Often cases, um, uh, in in teams that I've seen, we've used the concept of triages. Okay, so we have a triage box. Why? Um, during the sprint two weeks, the, the developers are often interfered. The product owner is often interfered by additional requests for work. 
can you in, in, you know add this feature can you um you know do an emergency work on this function uh you know this client needs this that and that and so on and so forth okay now in uh, um you know um uh, uh, organizational power play if it comes to a senior person the tendency is to accommodate that but that is breaking sprint planning because that was unplanned work so first put it into the triage and the product owner will be inspecting it and will be, you know, and, um, you know, whoever outside um, is requesting that can negotiate it with the product owner. That still is valid for your sprint goal. And it's going to realize the sprint goal, um, you know, uh, um, you know, with, with higher achievement, higher outcomes. So can you prioritize this? If this product owner agrees, it goes from triage into to do. And because you have a limited capacity, something has to come up to do something goes goes into the bump yeah this is how can, you can use a modified kanban board another great practice okay product backlog building just a really quick guide uh, um, uh, guide because um pra practical pragmatic because building the product backlog is one of the most daunting first things and you know it can take a lot of time okay so first define the product goal okay so you have your scrum team name put it in there and define your product goal, okay? This is your North Star. We want to develop a solution that will whatever, whatever. You know, our Scrum team's purpose is to build whatever product, okay? Make it big, audacious, all right? Next, you're going to brain spill. So in order to build this solution, in order to, to build a solution that will achieve, um, you know, the, the product goal, what do we need to do? Okay, brain spill, brain spill, brain spill, epic level, story level, task level, okay, it will come in all formats, just brain spill it, okay, because in the next um, step, we're going to group them, okay, small items combined are stories, stories combined are epics, okay, and you'll start to see patterns, different patterns, so the component of to, to realize the value of this, uh, you know, um, uh, product, okay, we need to have this part and we need to have this part and we need to have this part. You'll start to see, see these things, group it, group it, group it, okay? And then prioritize it, ordering, ordering, okay? So among these different epics, what are the important ones that you're gonna to have to do? Within those epics, what are the important stories that you have to, to address? Within those stories, what are the important tasks that you have to address? Break it down, break it down, break it down. Let the more important ones come up the surface, okay, closer and closer to the top, okay? And those are going to be the ones uh, that, because now it's in smaller units, okay, will be ready for picking for sprint planning. This is how you build a product backlog, okay? All right, so that concludes uh, the Scrum theory part and the Scrum um, uh, um, uh, uh, practice you know, um, uh, part. So um, from here, it's, it's really about uh, doing Scrum. So good luck about that. Um, in the meantime, uh, for those uh, um, going for a Scrum certification, okay, if you do choose scrum.org, I have a few you know, pointers for you. So I hope this is going to be helpful. Note that I am not affiliated with scrum.org um, and the following information is shared of my own personal knowledge of becoming Scrum certified, okay? It's my interpretation of the Scrum certification process. So um, for accurate Im information, go check the scrum.org website yourself, okay? Um, I, I make no, no, uh, no representation of accuracy of the information. All right, the most popular Scrum certification um, uh, for, for Scrum.org is PSM, Professional Scrum Master, okay? Um, it has three levels and the first level, okay, is PSM1, all right? Uh, it costs you 150 US dollars. Um, you know, you don't have to take a two, three thousand dollar course to to get uh, PSM certified. You just have to take the 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 uh, the, the certification exam. Um, you studied with me today, um, and 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 pretty much, uh, you know, you will be ready for that, with some exceptions, which I which I'll uh, explain. Okay, you need it's a 60 minute test, 80 minute multi uh, uh, MCQ um, uh, uh, test, and you need to get 85 percent to to pass. All right. Okay. All right. And uh, the link is here. The link is here. There's also an open assessment practice assessment for that. Similarly, 
um, if you are going to be uh, uh, um, the product owner for an upcoming uh, uh, Scrum, let's try becoming a PSPO, Professional Scrum Product Owner, okay? Again, three levels, all right? Okay, the first level is PSPO1. It's 200 US dollars uh, for test, all right? Um, uh, um, it's electronic. Uh, you can immediately, uh, you know, um, uh, subscribe to that and you'll, you'll be ready for the, to do the test, okay? 60 minutes, 80 questions, 85% passing score, same as PS, PSM1, all right? So there are three levels, PSM1, 2, 3, and PSPO1, 2, and 3, all right? As you can see, um, there's a big difference between PSM1 and PSM2, similarly with PSPO1 and PSPO2. Um, and indeed, it's, you know, PSM2 is pretty, pretty, you know, um, Pretty challenging, yes. Um, but as long as you really have the, the basics of Scrum uh, uh, theory, um, uh, Scrum rules uh, uh, covered, yes, um, you will. You should be able to pass PSM1 and PSPO1. All right, so how do you prepare for PSPO, PSM1 and PSPO1, okay? All right, so um, go to this link for, uh, you know, the left side is, is, uh, is um, uh, how how you can prepare for the PSM1 uh, exam, and uh, the right hand side is uh, how you can prepare for the PSPO1 uh, exam. There's a long list of reading material. Okay, um, the Scrum Guide is most important, and today we really thoroughly have gone through that. Nonetheless, there are a lot of uh, you know additional things that you would really want to look at the Scrum Guide from different perspectives. So I do encourage you to uh, look at the reading list and uh, you know read as much as possible. Okay, um, you know before taking the exam. Okay, and that goes same with the P the the, the PSPO. Um, uh, my count was I think there were there were about uh, a little over a hundred documents each. Uh, you know on on the recommended reading list for each PSM and PS PS PS. So it's quite a lot of reading there, but it will definitely help you. And especially if you're going to do PSM two or PSPO two, yes, you do have to read all of that. Okay, all right. Um, my gut feeling is that you know, um, PSM1 and PSPO1, you might not have to do all of their reading in order to pass. Um, you know, what we covered today is, is, is quite in-depth. And um, um, so, so the best way to see if you're ready or not is to try the official mock test. So both the Scrum Open, this is for Professional Scrum Master, and the uh, Product Owner Open, okay? Um, this is this is for, for PSPO uh, um, uh, preparation, okay? Go through these, there, there, there are 30 questions each, all right? Quite difficult, quite brain twisters, all right? Um, in the beginning, don't be discouraged if you make a lot of mistakes because, you know, it's about getting used to it, okay? But, um, you know, once you, uh, you know, read through the answers um, and uh, check what you made mistakes and compare that against the Scrum Guide, it will make sense, okay? And then keep on practicing the mock exam until you consistently get 100%. Even if you're going to take the only PSM1, I recommend you you you, you practice PSPO's um, uh, product on the open as well because it will get you prepared, all right? Okay. So, um, and, and there are quite a lot of questions that come out from, um, uh, from the, 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 the Scrum Open and the Product Owner Open that shows up in the actual uh, PSM1 and PSPO exam. So um, make sure you really, really thoroughly, uh, you know, do that, okay? All righty, okay. Now, one thing that uh, we didn't cover in today's Scrum Crash Course is scaling Scrum. Okay, so um, this one, um, the, the scrum.org's uh, choice of scaling Scrum is a framework called Nexus, okay? Um, it's a lightweight framework, you know, and it doesn't hurt to, to, to uh, you know, learn about that because there are a lot of commonalities with other scaled, uh, you know, agile frameworks, scaled Scrum frameworks, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, there will be a few questions on scaled Scrum, so you would have to prepare for that. So go to these list, uh, links, okay, left one and right right one, okay. It's a direct link to the long list of reading material for, for your um, you know, exam preparation, particularly for the scaled scrum. And there, I think it was like five, six, six, seven articles uh, that, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that you can read. Uh, one is including the Nexus guide. Um, so, so the scrum guide equivalent of scrum.org's preferred scaled scrum framework Nexus. So um, go ahead and read through that and that will get you prepared uh, for, for answering the scaled scrum questions in the exam.
Okay. Okay. So that concludes, uh, um, uh, you know, this this uh, this uh, this crash course. It's been a a pleasure um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, coaching you uh, on this crash course, and I wish you very good luck on uh, on, uh, um, on 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 starting your Scrum. And if you're going to get certified, I wish you very good luck on the certification as well. Contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.